Today, we're going to be transitioning to the section of this course where we'll be discussing how the brain has a, a, a chemical influence over the body that uh, obviously is driven in part by the nervous system, but also through the mechanisms of regulating hormones and hormone distribution. We're going to talk about the hypothalamus, which is the major hormonal regulation center for the body, but then we will also be discussing um, the underlying mechanisms of stress. What is the hypothalamus? Let's start there. So here's an overview of the brain. Got the cerebral cortex slash cerebrum right here. Cerebellum in the back. Here's the reticular formation down in here, which we'll be discussing a little bit more. This is uh, we have mentioned the medullary reticular formation several times. Uh, we also have the midbrain and the pons, which is where the ponti nuclei are that feed into the cerebellum. Here's the medulla, where we have a lot of decussation occurring. So this is a nice little simple overview. The hypothalamus is located in the diencephalon. It is located, the diencephalon is made up of the thalamus, which is number four here. And then there's the hypothalamus, hypo meaning below, below the thalamus. So the hypothalamus is number five. It's right at the base of the brain. And it's the um, uh, it's uh, a structure that's also connected to the pituitary gland, which is illustrated right here. Works together with this structure in order to control hormone release in the body. Don't get them, uh, just because we have hypothalamus and thalamus, in the same area of the brain and sharing basically the same word, they are very, very different. The thalamus, as we have learned, is a relay station that connects the somatosensory cortex to the motor system. It connects sensory systems to cortex as well. But the hypothalamus, its main function is homeostasis. And it does this primarily through coordination of uh, using hormones and regulates autonomic endocrine and motor responses to fulfill the body's homeostatic needs. The hypothalamus is made up of several subnuclei, and they each have distinct, distinct functions. These nuclei, they're illustrated here at the left. Uh, they can be grouped into ma three major hypothalamic regions, and that's mostly just based on anatomy. So first we have the supraoptic region. This is in blue. Um, this region sits right above the optic chiasm. To provide a little bit of context here, so this, we're looking at a zoomed in region right here. So this portion is obviously rostral towards the front of the brain. And then over on this edge, this is caudal towards the back of the brain, okay? So we're looking at a, a parasagittal section through the hypothalamus, really sagittal, mid-sagittal, like right down the middle. So this is the superoptic region in blue. Then we have the tuberal region, which are a series of distinct nuclei that sit above the infundibulum. The infundibulum is this uh, portion of the, it's at the very base of the hypothalamus, and it's where the stalk of the pituitary gland connects to the brain. Then we have in green the ma mammillary region. It sits just above the mammillary body, which is a portion of the mammillary region. Um, it's called the mammillary region because it kind of looks like breasts in the brain. Uh, these areas were defined by old white men in the mid-1800s, so that's that. As an aside, okay, uh, we're going to be looking at this slide and in the next. You do not need to know all of these nuclei. You only need to know the ones that we cover over the next several lectures. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, basic nuclei that are in here that we will not be discussing in the uh, um, and so you don't need to have them memorized, okay? But this is just to provide orientation so that you have some sense of what the hypothalamus looks like. So let's take a different perspective of the hypothalamus. Now we're looking at a series of coronal sections going through the hypothalamus at uh, these different subregions. So we're essentially looking at the same nuclei, but now we're looking at what it looks like on both the left and the right. When we were looking before, we were just looking at one half of the brain and seeing sort of a 3D reconstruction of one half of the hypothalamus. Now we're taking several sections going through coronally, starting rostral to go all the way to caudal. And we start obviously with the superoptic region in blue. And to highlight some of the nuclei that we see in the superoptic region, we see um, the preoptic nuclei, lateral and medial preoptic nuclei. We also have the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which we won't be talking about in this 
uh, um, portion of the course, but we will be talking about the suprachiasmatic nucleus when we talk about sleep. Let's go to the next one. So this is a slice through the tuberal region in red. Some important nuclei here is the paraventricular nucleus. It's called the paraventricular nucleus because it runs right along the third ventricle. So this dark region is the ventricle. And paraventricular means like right along the, the, the uh, nucleus. Paraventricular is right here. There's also a periventricular nucleus, which really kind of goes right up next to it. So paraventricular, periventricular. This is showing the, um, another, there's a little bit of the optic chiasm that you can see at the tuberal region. Um, and then it starts to split off as you get a little bit farther back going to LGN. And what else do we have in here? There's uh, the super optic nucleus is another important nucleus. Lateral nucleus is another one that we'll be discussing. Um, we have, if we go back a little bit farther, um, now you can see that the periventricular nucleus really is hugging the entire ventricle. Um, we still have, um, we have a dorsal medial nucleus. Uh, so a lot of these names are just referring to really their location, but we will be discussing them in a little bit more detail later. Then once we get to the mammillary region, um, these are actually nuclei that we aren't really going to be discussing much. Um, the the mammillary bodies, like I mentioned, they sort of look like breasts when you look underneath. So stupid. But that's what they're named for. That's why it's called the mammillary region. Uh, again, you do not need to know all these nuclei. You will just need to know the ones that we're covering over the next four lectures. However, you should know that there is this, that the hypothalamus is broken into three main regions, the supraoptic nucleus, the tuberal region, and the mammillary region. And that this is the order from rostral to caudal. The hypothalamus has some basic functions in which it provides this homeostasis drive. So let's talk about some of the homeostatic needs that the hypothalamus regulates. There's the stress response. This is, uh, we'll be covering this in detail today. Um, so I don't want to get into the details just yet. Ingestive behavior, feeding and drinking, uh, which we have a whole lecture on. It has regulation over blood pressure. The sleep-wake cycle, which we'll talk about in the fourth portion of this class. We won't be talking about regulation of body temperature, but that is something else that the hypothalamus regulates. Energy metabolism, again, this is actually through the thing that I study, which is thyroid hormone, but we won't be discussing it. And um, reproduction. And, and in fact, for this, this is such a big topic that we're going to be discussing that over one and a half lectures. The hypothalamus also has um, significant influence over emotional and motivated behaviors. It regulates fight or flight behavioral responses, threatening stimuli or simulations. Uh, the motivated behaviors, including uh, feeding, sexual, and other behaviors integral to promoting survival and reproduction. Uh, also included in this is social behaviors, such as um, affiliative behaviors in, uh, across uh, within social groups. Um, and then also, of course, parenting behaviors. We'll be discussing that a little bit. There's also aggression and rage. That's also something in which the hypothalamus plays a major role. Some of that involved with the stress systems, um, but the, uh, yes, it's another aspect of this. And we will talk um, a little bit about uh, aggressive behaviors and the role of the hypothalamus in that. There are inputs to the hypothalamus, just like any kind of brain area, it receives all kinds of inputs. So we're gonna walk through the various inputs to the hypothalamus. There is inputs from the prefrontal cortex. So we haven't discussed the prefrontal cortex much uh, up to this point, but we will be discussing a lot of the prefrontal cortex. It'll be coming up over and over again over for the rest of the course. So the prefrontal cortex, as far as the hypothalamus is concerned, it provides processed sensory information to the hypothalamus. And so it'll synapse on various portions of the hypothalamus. We have the cingulate cortex. This is an emotional processing center. Um, it, uh, it's a uh, cortical region and it sends information about the emotional state to the hypothalamus. We have the hippocampus and the amygdala, um, both of which, uh, provide emotionally relevant information to integrate the autonomic response with the emotional state. The hippocampus actually does play a significant role over emotional states as well. It's not just learning and memory as many of you probably know. 
um, it has a significant emotional component to it. Also uh, providing input to the hypothalamus. The reticular formation and the nuclei of the solitary tract. This provides information about arousal and visceral information. So this is, uh, it's telling you whether you're hungry or not, um, whether you're feeling sick or not. And this will have an influence over obviously hormone secretion and overall autonomic responses of the nervous system. And a lot of that is integrated by these areas of the brain. The thalamus and the hypothalamus, they all, so the thalamus sends information to the hypothalamus. We also have the hypothalamus obviously has integration centers within itself that allows for um, responding to physiological stimuli such as temperature, blood osmolality, or glucose. So we have a, a bunch of different distinct homeostatic regulation centers that are just even integrated within the hypothalamus itself. Then there is retinal input. We will discuss this in greater detail when we talk about sleep in the fourth portion of this class. But this is what, uh, there's, there are direct connections from the retina to the hypothalamus, to the, to the uh, uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus, and this regulates uh, circadian rhythm. So how we fall asleep and when we need to wake up, that is regulated through this uh, connection. Again, we're not gonna be discussing this in detail, but what you do need to know is that there are these, there's a bunch of different areas of the brain that do send inputs to the hypothalamus. And that the hypothalamus, in order for it to sense changes within the brain and within the body, it has to take this information in from various places. And because it's a homeostatic center, it's not surprising that it takes information from a ton of different areas across the brain. It also has outputs. And um, in order for it to exert its homeostatic regulation, it synapses down to other various areas of the brain. So it has reciprocal connections to the prefrontal cortex, the septum, the cingulate cortex. So not only does it receive input from many of these areas, it also has connections to those areas as well. So that it can provide sort of additional influence over those areas. So prefrontal cortex into cingulate right here. Um, it has connections to the, to the hippocampus, which would be located down here. It also has connections to the amygdala, uh, to the periaqueductal gray, so helping to regulate pain as well as the brainstem. And then of course it has connections to the spinal cord. So another crucial output of the hypothalamus is release of hormones into the per peripheral bloodstream through its connections to, into the pituitary gland. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time focusing on this. We will talk a little bit about the integration of hypothalamus and the amygdala primarily to its connections to the autonomic nervous system. And we're gonna be discussing that in just a little bit within this lecture. But mostly what we're gonna be discussing is how the hypothalamus regulates the release of hormones into the bloodstream and then how that influences overall uh, behaviors and uh, other characteristics and homeostasis within the body. The critical output of the hypothalamus as far as hormones is concerned is the pituitary gland. So this is where the pituitary gland is located. It's on the underside of the brain. And it looks like this P-shaped size structure. Kind of looks like testicles in a scrotum. I hate to say, but that's what it look, kind of looks like. It's got two lobes. Uh, it has an anterior portion and a uh, posterior portion. So one is in the front and one is in the back. This is the infundibulum that connects it to the rest of the brain. So I, I mentioned that earlier. <clears throat> so these two lobes are very distinct and they, they, um, the different kinds of hormone systems that are within, that the hypothalamus regulates are, are generally split between the anterior pituitary or the posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is also known as the adenohypophysis and I'll explain why it's called that in just a bit. Uh, this front portion secretes hormones that influence growth, sexual development, skin pigmentation, thyroid function, and adrenocortical function, and, uh, which are essentially referred to stress hormones. We also have the posterior pituitary. This is referred to also as the neurohypophysis. So this portion is in the back, it's in the posterior portion, and it secretes the hormones oxytocin and vasopressin, those are the primary hormones that come out of the posterior pituitary. 
and that these hormones are going to be related to milk letdown, um, birthing, uh, sexual uh, uh, affiliative behavior, and social structure. So let's talk a little bit about the connections between the hypothalamus uh, to the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is an, it's actually an, uh, it's a gland. And that's why it's also known as the adenohypophysis. Adeno meaning a, like um, a hormone secreting gland. The, um, uh, which, is, which is different than the posterior pituitary or the neurohypophysis, which is essentially just an extension of the brain. In fact, when the brain is developing, this part of the pituitary, the adenohypophysis, doesn't arise from the neural portions of the developing embryo. The neurohypophysis does, but this comes from a different part, and then it kind of sneaks up and then attaches itself to the brain, sort of like, like um, you know, like uh, Venom and Spider-Man, like crawling around and like connecting itself. It's, that's kind of what the adenohypophysis does uh, when it's developing, and so it's it's a it's an adrenal-like structure. So the it is regulated by what are called parvocellular secretory cells in the hypothalamus uh, that secrete hormones that travel to the anterior pituitary. So the way this works is that there are cells in various different sub of these different subnuclei within the hypothalamus, these parvocellular secretory cells. These are neurons, and they have axons that extend down to this uh, capillary bed that sits within the infundibulum. And uh, the the axons abut right up next to this deep this uh, highly vascularized capillary bed, and it releases its factors into that capillary bed. Then those factors, uh, these are a different set of hormones. They go down here, um, and then go down to the adenohypophysis. So yeah, let's walk through this uh, again just briefly. So the parvocellular cells in the hypothalamus, they project to this portion of the infundibulum. This is also known as the median eminence. Um, and they release their hormones into this um, uh, capillary bed, which is uh, also known as the portal blood supply. So these factors that are released by these neurons, they get transported down into the pituitary cells in the adenohypophysis. And they bind to those secretory cells that are within the, the, um, the adenohypophysis. And then those cells release the hormone that then gets released into the bloodstream. And so that's the general pattern for which this occurs. So you have these neurons in the hypothalamus, they release a factor into this capillary system the capillary system then transports that initial factor down into the adenohypophysis, where those factors bind to receptors on the specialized cells within the adenohypophysis to release a different hormone that then gets released into the bloodstream and then sent out to the body, right here. So, and then that hormone will, uh, it, it depends on the hormone that we're talking about, but many of the hormones that are released from the adenohypophysis they actually have another gland that they need to target where um, that'll receive that input and then it'll act upon that gland in, in order to induce that gland to release hormone as well. The peripheral hormones that are released by those glands, they feed back onto the hypothalamus in order to regulate its release. This is referred to as negative feedback and it's to make sure the system doesn't become overstimulated. And we'll talk about that in detail when we talk about stress hormones and sex hormones, which have this classic response. So here's a summary of anterior pituitary hormones and their functions. We will only be talking about the hormones that are in red, and we'll be talking about them over the next several lectures. We're not going to be talking about uh, the ones that are in black, such as growth hormone right here, or thyrotropic stimulating hormone, which causes the thyroid gland to, to, to release its hormones. Even though this is what I work on, I'm not going to make you learn it. Uh, instead, we're going to talk about the ones that are in red. And today, we're only going to be talking about the corticotropin releasing hormone, which allows, which is released by the hypothalamus, that acts on the uh, adenohypophysis to induce secretion of ACTH, that activates the adrenal cortex to then stimulate the release of, of uh, steroid stress hormones. <laughs>
Um, and then we'll talk about these when we talk about sex. So that section was just the summary of what the hypothalamus is, its overall anatomy, and some of the basic features of the hypothalamus. From here on, we will be revisiting certain parts of that, but we'll be taking those basic concepts and applying them to specific functions that the hypothalamus regulates. Today, we're gonna to be talking about stress. And we're gonna break this into two parts. We're gonna first talk about how there is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or the HPA axis. This is known as the stress axis. And it is exactly that pathway that I just mentioned with, uh, with CRH leading to release of ACTH, which leads to the release of stress hormones like cortisol. We will also be talking about the autonomic nervous system, which is the essentially kind of known as the fight or flight physiological response. And this isn't necessarily driven by the, um, the stress axis. It can have influence over it. And in fact, the stress axis can be heavily influenced by the autonomic nervous system. Uh, so, um, and they're, they're two slightly different things, but they, they both are involved in the same important function, which is um, getting the body ready to deal with fight or, or flight and dealing with stressful situations. So let's talk about stress. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the concept of stress. In the age of COVID, who of us is not uh, influenced by stress? Many of us, all of us. We're all under a lot of stress. So what do we mean by stress when we talk about uh, stress? What I mean by it, uh, this is just a basic def dictionary definition. It is a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from demanding circumstances. There are, we all face stress, uh, but the, you know we're not the only ones. Um, uh, the stress is a universal phenomenon seen in all animals. You can see that there's a lot of stress going on for this guy right here. Uh, he is running his butt off to get away from this predator, but the predator is also under stress here. The predator is probably hungry. It's dealing with, uh, you know, this, uh, this lion here is, is a meat eater and it needs to eat. And it's probably just feeling some basic stress, overall stress from that, of the, the need to, to eat and feeling very hungry. The excitement of having, being ready to chase a predator and then getting into the act of chasing the predator also induces a stress response as well. And I, of course, I don't have to explain to you how stressful this would be for this guy. So both animals experiencing stress, it is a th normal function that allows um, animals to increase their peak performance in, in certain circumstances. And that's generally what it's used for. But there are side effects to stress and especially chronic stress. So chronic stress can have huge influences over the body. And this has been, this is a big issue for understanding how stress impacts bodily function in humans. Uh, he, all, um, all of us are faced with constant chronic stress and it leads, has certain effects. So we can talk about how it affects the brain, such as including inducing mood issues and changes in energy and lack of concentration, sleep issues. Um, it can lead to, uh, in worst scenarios, it can lead to anxiety disorders and panic attacks. We also have um, include, uh, blood pressure is, is uh, something that's affected by stress, changes in the immune system and recovery from illness. Uh, it can lead to gastrointestinal disorders. It can lead to loss of libido, lower sperm production for men, and uh, changes for periods for women, aches and pains in joints and muscles, and it can even affect bone density. So there, the, the effects of chronic stress are significant and severe. We'll be discussing a little bit of that um, uh, in just a few more slides, uh, but this is a very interesting topic and um, it's something that unfortunately we just don't have a whole lot of time to get into. Um, but there, uh, the, this particular topic is, is one of the main central themes of what the HOTUS lab studies. So they're also here in the School of Neuroscience. And if you want to learn more about what um, the influence of stress is, and in particular, they look at the effects of stress on mood and the immune system, and that the immune system being the connection between the two, uh, they do some really super interesting work. I encourage you to look at HOTUS lab papers and their website. So what's the whole point of having stress? Well, the idea is that um, stress, the stress system 
allows us to have peak performance. This was a, an idea, a model that was developed. It's referred to as the Yerkes Dodson Law. This is kind of developed in the 50s and 60s. And it dictates that performance will increase with physiological or mental arousal, but there's a limit to that, obviously. So, um, you know, in most states, you're sit, laying around, you're just watching some Netflix, and, um, and then all of a sudden, uh, you realize, oh, crap, I've got uh, a neuro introduction to neuroscience to test tomorrow that I totally forgot about. Uh, I better start studying. And then you got this deadline coming, and all of a sudden, you might have this immediate stress response. You're now super awake. You, you're turning off your Netflix. And that's going to, uh, this, the stress hormones will travel around your body, affect your brain and affect function, release some glucose. And presumably this is going to increase performance. And so uh, that's going to be the ideal scenario. <laughs> the problem is that uh, you can get too stressed. And um, if you are chronically stressed, you're going to actually impact performance. So if you have too much stress and you have this hormone around you all the time, you are going to have um, these these other basic issues of chronic stress, such as mental fatigue, um, lethargy, uh, irritability, uh, increased incidence of disease, um, and aches and pains. Not good, right? But too low performance. Let's say you realize you have a, a deadline coming up. You're supposed to study for this test, but you know what? Like I don't care. Whatever. I'm not going to do it. If you don't have that immediate sort of stress response, you might just lay in bed and continue to sleep, and then your performance is going to be very low. So uh, stress always has um, a, an advantage when used and delivered in the proper way, but too little or too much can have negative effects. And so that's part of the idea behind the yerkes dodson law. So corticotropin releasing hormone, this is the first step in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or HPA axis. <clears throat> the um, so corticotropin releasing hormone, we'll just refer to it as CRH. This is found the these cells are in um, is released by parvocellular cells that are in the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus in response to, to stress. So paraventricular nucleus. This is right here. This isn't the periventricular nucleus. This is the paraventricular nucleus. It's in the more dorsal portion of the hypothalamus. It's pretty high up. And it's filled with all of these um, uh, parvocellular cells. It receives inputs, obviously, uh, that, that connect to these different areas. But then we have these CRH positive neurons that then uh, send their axons down into the median eminence, into the infundibulum, also known as the infundibular stalk. And they release CRH into the portal area. Um, one way that we can identify the paraventricular nucleus is that uh, that we can do what's called in situ hybridization to look for which areas of the brain are expressing CRH. So there's going to be, CRH is a protein, but it has to be made through the expression of mRNA, obviously, right? You have a gene for CRH. That gene will be turned on in these, per, uh, in these um, parvocellular cells that are within the paraventricular nucleus. Some signals say, hey, you are a CRH neuron. You need to be making CRH. You'll have mRNA that will increase. And that mRNA uh, needs to be turned into protein. There's a technique in which you can label just the mRNA. So, and that will be in the cell bodies, right? The CRH is a protein that's being released by the, uh, by the axons down here in the median eminence. But if you want to just see which cells are expressing the mRNA, you can do this technique called in situ hybridization, where you have uh, a complementary nucleotide sequence that will bind to the mRNA for CRH. And then you can do staining to see which, which areas of the brain are expressing it. And so what we're seeing here is um, this is a, uh, a like a rainbow image. Um, it's like a false color image of looking at the intensity of the expression. So all the blue areas, so this is like an entire brain section. All this has uh, brain areas here, and we're looking at a coronal section. So there would be a, a ventricle right here. And what you can see is that there's tons of RNA right here in the paraventricular nucleus. 
Uh, and this is really the only area in the brain where you're going to find CRH expressed. So it's well, an easy way of identifying the paraventricular nucleus. So these paraventricular cells expressing CRH, they release the CRH into the uh, into the uh, the capillary bed in the median eminence slash infundibulum, and then the CRH is then carried through these capillaries down to the adenohypophysis. The the uh, the CRH is then um, released from the capillary beds and it binds to a type of secretagogue, that's the name of these, these adrenal cells that are located in the adenohypophysis, called a corticotrope. So this is a subset of secretagogues that's within the adenohypophysis. These are within the, uh, the adenohypophysis, the anterior pituitary, and they release um, adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH. And I will be referring to those as ACTH. I won't be saying adrenocorticotropic because it's a little hard for me to say. Then that ACTH is released into the bloodstream. So that process is um, the mRNA increases in these cells and that causes more CRH to be produced. And then it gets released here in the axons to the capillary bed. It gets transported down to the adenohypophysis, which then acts onto the corticotropes. And then that binds to CRH receptors that are expressed by those corticotropes and then induces the production and release of adrenocorticotropic hormone or ACTH into the bloodstream, which then goes out this way. And then that acts on the next, which is the adrenal glands. So ACTH circulates around the body, and it, um, and it, but its main target is the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands, they're referred to, um, they're called adrenal because they are above the kidneys, which is part of the renal system. So adrenal means to, uh, means above renal and um, or next to renal. So the, this is the adrenal glands. They always sit above the kidneys. And this is, they ha will have ACTH receptors. So a ACTH will bind to the adrenal glands and induce the release of various hormones. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are some of the hormones that are released by adrenal glands. But the one that's primarily involved with the stress response that we're most familiar with is, is cortisol. So cortisol, when this is released, it elicits a number of effects throughout the brain and the body. It mobilizes energy stores. So the cortisol now is going to circulate all around the body and get uh, glucose being released so that there's glucose available for, you know, if you have to run away from a lion or deal with an introduction in neuroscience test, you're going to have glucose. It's going to increase your arousal and vigilance. It's going to allow for greater focused attention. And actually what it does is it su suppresses immune uh, function at that time as well. So if any of you have issues with um, uh, allergies or asthma, you might take a, um, a cortisol-based inhaler. And that's essentially cortisol. And what it's doing is that that's then binding to certain cortisol receptors that are within your lungs to tamp down the immune system so that you can reduce the immune function. And EpiPen does something similar. So that's actually ep epinephrine in that case, but it also, epinephrine serves to suppress immune function as well. So if someone is allergic to bee stings, they carry around an EpiPen with them and they can quickly inject themselves to knock down their immune system so that they don't die. We can measure hormones. So you can take samples of blood and see um, what the hormones look like. And so here's an example of what this profile looks like, illustrating that we have the surge in ACTH that precedes the surge in cortisol. And this is showing a, a pretty good timeline of the, of the release of this. Um, it can be faster than this, but this is, this is relatively accurate. So we have ACTH uh, shown in the, the solid line and cortisol in the dotted line. It's relatively low. It's not zero, but it's relatively low. There's always a little bit of these hormones present at all times. And, um, and then we can introduce a stress, a stressor that's lasting here for about 15 minutes. And we see a sharp increase in ACTH. That makes sense because ACTH is going to precede cortisol. And then we start to see an increase in cortisol as well. Once the stress, stressful event ends, we have uh, ACTH going down pretty quickly. So the stressful event has ended, and now the drive to release, to have the, the CRH releasing and acting on ACTH is decreased. 
but there's still some ACTH floating around in the blood and it's still going to be acting on the adrenal glands. So the stress response lasts for 30 minutes, an hour, even though we're only talking about a 15 minute stressful response. And if any of you have ever been in some sort of stressful situation um, that was relatively quick, you usually have this like intense focus and hyper arousal uh, that lasts for quite some time after that. It takes about 30 minutes for you to chill out and relax. And a lot of that is just because it takes some time for cortisol, for the, for the ACTH to, to decrease in your body, as well as the cortisol to, to go down as well. So you can see the cortisol following, the peak is, is actually a little bit later, and then it decreases afterwards. There is also this important part of the negative feedback loop. So why, why does this decrease? It's not simply just because ACTH is just going down. There's also cortisol acts back onto the brain in order to reduce the expression. So cortisol circulates around the body and it's, it's binding to corticoid receptors that are across the body, but also in the brain. And some of these are located in the hypothalamus, in the paraventricular nucleus, in the CRH uh, releasing neurons that are the parvocellular cells in the hypothalamus. This, when cortisol binds to those receptors, it then turns off the secretion of CRH and then the levels of overall cortisol will decrease um, as that happens. So this is the negative feedback loop in which this occurs. Now this, um, so, and, it, and it, this is a way of maintaining homeostasis. It's a way of getting a surge in a hormone that will induce certain effects, but because we know, our bodies know, that having the hormone around for too long can actually be damaging, it has a way of turning itself off. And this is the mechanism by which it does it. This is referred to negative as negative feedback. It's a way, uh, this isn't the only system that does this. Sex hormones work very similarly, as do other hormones. But this is a critical understanding of, of the system, right? So we have these things that this will induce the release of this, this induces the release of this, but now this, the cortisol, goes back and then shuts everything off. This is actually very similar to um, the analogy I like to draw as to uh, the way a, um, a furnace works in your home. So let's say, let's say you get home, you've been away on vacation, everyone turns their furnace down, um, even though it's winter, you know, you don't want your furnace up too high because there's no point in heating the house when no one's there, right? But you don't want it off completely because you don't want your pipes to freeze because that would be bad too. So you might turn it down to like 50 degrees. Uh, but then when you get home, that's too cold, right? Like I'm freezing my butt off here and I need to turn the heat up. So essentially what happens then is you go to the thermostat and you turn the heat up, you turn the nozzle the, the knob all the way up to say 72, because you're pretty cold. Now, what that does, that's essentially what is happening in the hypothalamus. There's a recognition that, hey, uh, I need to turn the heat up. We need some cortisol. So that's where the, the thermostat is essentially like CRH. It's saying like, all right, this is now what we need. So the hypothalamus starts releasing a whole bunch of CRH, which then acts on the ACTH. And this is basically like the electronics going from the, the thermostat to the furnace and says, hey, you know what? We need some heat. Why don't you start releasing uh, the heat? And so the ACTH increases and then that acts on the furnace, which is like the adrenal gland. And this is where the heat gets made. And so now the adrenal gland is gonna say, okay, we need some heat. So let's start pumping out heat. And that's gonna be the cortisol. But eventually you're gonna have so much heat and it's just that you don't need anymore. And the way a thermostat works is that it also has a thermometer in it that measures the temperature. And when you set your thermostat, you're basically saying, turn on the heat until you reach this temperature. And so then the heat is generated, AKA cortisol, and eventually it makes its way to the thermostat. And as soon as the thermostat says, okay, that's enough. We don't need any more heat. Then it turns off the signal. And so this is negative feedback. Heat, even though the thermostat is used to increase heat, the heat will eventually get to the point where it turns it off. So a thermostat and uh, these mechanisms in the brain, they work the same exact way. Acute stress is important to have an immediate response to a stressful situation. We can talk about like 
as far as humans are concerned, a new challenge. When you're in an athletic competition, uh, you're giving a presentation at work, you might feel, or at, in school, you're going to feel very stressful, uh, like super stressed out, but that can actually serve to improve your performance because it's going to increase your arousal and you're going to have more glucose and you're going to be sharper and paying attention. Lifting heavy weights is something that uh, induces a stress response and can have this feed forward mechanism of getting even um, more uh, weight lifted. Um, running sprints, another stressful thing that will actually have a beneficial effect. But chronic stress can be a big problem, right? So, and examples of this is driving to work, not so much here, but for those of you in Nova, certainly you know about traffic jams, annoying bosses or professors, um, uh, having a bad work schedule, a difficult significant other, poor sleep habits, staying up too late and watching too much Netflix, that's always bad, and having negative friends in your life. All of these are going to be chronic stressors. They can lead to certain things like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, immunosuppression, insulin resistance. So um, part of the increase in diabetes too is likely to be due in part to the chronic stressful life that most of us lead. Also emotional disorders, anxiety and depression. So these are all negative effects. <clears throat> How does chronic stress affect the brain? So I'm gonna walk through an experiment in which this has been done. Uh, so um, we know that it affects human brains, but many of these kinds of experiments get done in rodent models. So we're gonna talk about an experiment that uh, done in rats where they were exposed to five different conditions. So in the first group, we just have a control. Every good experiment is going to have some kind of control group. And um, these, are, these are rats that are under normal lab conditions for one month. So they're just living their regular lat, rat lives. We have another group of rats that was given chronic stress. And every single day they were getting some random choice of, of a stressful situation, such as being injected with a whole bunch of saline, being put into an overcrowded cage, uh, restraint, um, which I'll talk about briefly in just a sec, um, placement on a shaking platform uh, once a day for a whole month. So they're getting one of these various stressors for an entire month. They never know which day, they're, uh, what kind of stress they're going to get. So unpredictable intermittent stress. So this is what the restraint procedure looks like. Uh, it looks pretty awful. It, I can, I, I'm sure that you would agree. But in fact, these, these, uh, and and it's it's stressful to the rats to be shoved into a tube like this. But in, um, I can assure you that the rats, uh, they actually can breathe perfectly fine. Um, it doesn't actually affect their overall basic physiology, but it is a stressful situation to be restricted like this. And they will hold them in this position for an hour or several hours and then just release them. So that's what the chronic restraint looks like. All right. The next one is stress followed by recovery. The, uh, so these animals were stressed and then they were given a month uh, break after that. So they were stressed for a month and then they had a month break. So it's basically like this group, but then given a break for a month. Then we have other animals that were just injected with uh, corticosterone or cortisol for, uh, for a whole month. They didn't get any of these stressful conditions. They were just injected with cortisol. The last group is cortisol for a month followed by recovery. And so that's referred to court and for one month and then one month break. Pretty similar to this, but instead of stress, they're just getting injected with cortisol. So in this study, and this is the link here if you wanna look at the, the actual paper, they did a bunch of different measurements. I'm just showing you one result that they found which was looking at dendrite length within uh, a group of neurons within the hypothalamus. And so they looked at the length of these dendrites in the control groups. They were usually normally around 1500 microns in length, micrometers here. And this is the error bar. And what you can see is that in the stress group, so this is the group getting that chronic stress for a month, they killed them. Then they looked at the dendrites of, those hypo, uh, of the hippocampal neurons. You can see that the dendrites were shorter. And they were about a third shorter, right? They're around uh, 1,000 microns in length. The letters above the bars are indicating significant differences. So A is significantly greater than B. So this is significantly, this has been reduced. Stress induced a regression of the dendrite length of these neurons. 
The good thing is that there is some recovery. It's not a significant recovery in that this is not significantly different from this or this. That's why it's called AB. But there's some improvement, right? It's not, it's not significantly lower than the controls either. Something in between. Interestingly, the um, so is this driven by hormones? Well, that's what the hormone injection studies would indicate. So when they injected the animals with just cortisol, not stress, the, the intermittent stress, just cortisol, they saw a, a very similar effect to on the dendrite length as they did in the stress response. So cortisol itself was able to reduce dendrite length in the hippocampus. And again, very similarly to the stress and recovery group, a cortisol recovery group, um, one month of recovery allowed for the dendrites to actually grow back again. So the brain has a lot of plasticity. This is something that I talk about in my neuroplasticity class, but the, this effect of chronic stress can have a huge influence on overall brain activity and even brain anatomy, such as this about the affecting dendrite length. The good thing is that there's recovery that's possible. So if you can eliminate those stressors out of your life, you can actually have recovery. So that's the discussion about the stress axis and the stress response. Now we're gonna talk about the autonomic nervous system, which is the fight or flight response system. And so these are gonna be some of the immediate physiological responses that will have an influence over hormone secretion, but this is gonna be um, actually faster than that because it's the nervous system doing the work instead of hormones. So instead of acting over minutes, this is gonna be acting over seconds and milliseconds. So what is the autonomic nervous system? This is a portion of the nervous system that is found in the periphery. It's part of the peripheral nervous system. And it controls numerous involuntary physiological processes, um, innervating the body's internal organs, smooth muscle groups, and cardiac muscles. Examples of the functions that are under the control of the autonomic nervous system are blood pressure, heart rate, digestion, respiratory rate, pupillary response. Those are just different examples. There are two, there's two divisions to the autonomic nervous system. There's the parasympathetic division and the sympathetic division. And so we're gonna be talking about the balance of these two divisions for the remainder of this lecture. First, we need to compare the autonomic nervous system to the somatic motor system, which we have already dis discussed. So the somatic motor system refers to these motor neurons that are in the spinal cord that innervate skeletal muscles. So this is the somatic motor system. The autonomic motor nervous system controls other CNS innervated tissues and body organs that are not related to skeletal muscle. They control smooth muscle groups found in digestive system, glands, that kind of thing. There's innervation of the cardiac muscles um, as well. <clears throat> the other important point is that there are, uh, the autonomic nervous system operates through a middleman, which are these ganglia. So these are groups of neurons that exist inside your body that is outside of the spinal cord. This is probably something most of you don't realize, but we have these groups of neurons that sit in various places within our body. These are ganglia, kind of like if you know anything about the nervous system of invertebrates, that their bodies are made up of ganglia, well, it turns out that vertebrates have a somewhat similar organization as well. That we have these groups of neurons that are sitting outside of the central nervous system that get innervated by the central nervous system. So these are referred to as autonomic ganglia. And Neurons that are in the autonomic ganglia are called postganglionic neurons. So that's what these neurons are that are within the ganglia. The cell body would be located here, and then they innervate the smooth muscle, muscles, cardiac muscles, and glands. So here's for the sympathetic, post parasympathetic right here. Neurons that are part of the autonomic nervous system, but the cell bodies are within the spinal cord and brain stem, uh, they are in the uh, these are preganglionic neurons. So that's what these neurons are referred to as. This is a figure that shows that the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system have common inputs to similar bodily functions. So this is showing parasympathetic division on the right, sympathetic division on the left. 
You don't need to have all these connections memorized. I'm not expecting you to memorize which nerves are innervating the different portions of, of the different viscera and organs and that kind of thing. But this is a nice illustration of the kinds of things that are um, regulated, at least. So we have nerves that innervate the eyes. So, um, and um, regulate con uh, pupil contraction, dilation of the pupils, uh, secretion of saliva, sweat, and tears, and mucus that are under nervous control are, that's all regulated by the autonomic nervous system. Regulation of the heart and blood vessels. We've got innervation to, to actual blood vessels where the smooth muscles that make up the capillary system, they will contract or relax to change blood pressure. Same for heartbeat, regulating the, the, the speed of the heart. Oxygen delivery, so we can have um, regulation over smooth muscles that make up the lungs. We also have uh, regulation of digestion, uh, regulation of the liver function, stomach function, the, the uh, intestines, uh, small and large. We have regulation over sex and reproduction as well as regulation over the body's immune system. So essentially all the involuntary functions that need input from the nervous system are heavily regulated by the autonomic nervous system. The other thing is that if you look closely at the different types of things that the parasympathetic division is doing versus the sympathetic division, you can kind of see something um, that uh, about the things that 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 the, the different systems are doing. So the parasympathetic division is one that sort of keeps things going the way it's supposed to be going. And then the sympathetic division is something that will allow the body to react to challenging situations. So you can see that in the sympathetic division, we have acceleration of heartbeat so that the heart is going to increase its speed versus the sympathetic parasympathetic division, which slows the heartbeat and allowing it to relax. Constricting the blood vessels will allow for blood pressure to rise so that blood can get around faster and get oxygen to areas faster. Relaxing the airways actually allows for increased lung capacity. Dilation of the pupil allows for more light to get in so that you can take in more light to be more aware of your surroundings. Sim uh, stimulation of the secretion of epinephrine and norepinephrine allows for the suppression of the immune system and for activating glucose stores so that you can have glucose that's ready. Uh, suppression of digestion is something that you don't need when your body is being challenged by a stressful situation. So the parasympathetic division is one that sort of more or less it uh, operates to just sort of keep things going. Things are fine. Whereas the sympathetic division, when it is activated, it acts as the stress response. And these, the, these two things, and so that's just sort of a, a general framework for how these two systems sort of operate in opposite to each other, and that there's a balance that's struck between the two systems. Also at the bottom, just to note that we have the, um, that you can see the preganglionic neurons as they illustrate right here. Uh, and then there's the postganglionic neurons on both sides. You can see both sides operate through ganglia and that there's a synapse somewhere in the body where you have this division. So I want to highlight for you this opposing function of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. And this is a nice table that illustrates this difference. So again, you have, let's focus on the parasympathetic response, which is dedicated to maintaining regular body function where you have, uh, let's see, effects on the lungs that allows for constriction of the lungs so that you don't need as much uh, air capacity getting into the lungs. So you don't need to, to accumulate so much oxygen. You have a regular low heart rate. Uh, blood vessels are large and so that the blood isn't, the blood pressure is relatively low. You have regular function of the smooth muscles that make up the digestive system so that you're getting regular digestion. That's peristalsis. Uh, constriction of the bladder, so like it'll have, um, this will mean that the that you're not going to pee. Um, 
and uh, an and increased salivation because, you know, salivation is part of the, the digestive process. So it's this rest and digest is one way of thinking of it, that this is something that it's, that it's doing. And, and in general, this is where if you're in a relaxed, normal homeostatic state, it's going to be your parasympathetic system that's going to be doing most of the work. But when you're in some sort of crisis mode and you've been challenged, you're going to have the sympathetic nervous system be activated, and then you will have a, a variety of things that will occur that are going to be essentially the opposite of the parasympathetic response with increased heart rate, high blood pressure, relaxation of the muscles so that you are no longer digesting because it's a waste of energy to do that. Sometimes animals and even people, when they're super scared, they will pee. This is actually a response that uh, can serve to protect the animal because an animal covered with urine will smell bad and not be so tasty to predators. And this is just a response that most animals will do. So all of this is, it is more of the fight or flight type of responses. And it's definitely part of the stress response, whereas the parasympathetic response is to sort of maintain normal bodily function and homeostasis. If you've been paying close attention to the tables and diagrams that I've been showing you, you will have seen that there's some funny things about some of the neurotransmitters that you find in the autonomic nervous system. So let's first, you know, to start off, we'll compare it to the somatic nervous system. These are the neurons that make up the lower motor neurons and um, the facial nerves that innervate the muscles. That are make that are part of the skeletal muscle system. This is what we talked about in the motor portion of this course, and these are just regular motor neurons that release acetylcholine onto neuromuscular junctions to induce contraction of muscles. In the autonomic nervous system, it's a little bit complicated. We have acetylcholine being released by those similar types of neurons that are located within the spinal cord. That's at least where their cell bodies are. They have these axons that, that leave the body, leave the, uh, the spinal cord and innervate the different ganglia. Those neurons release acetylcholine. So that is normal. And then uh, so that's very similar to the types of neurons that we find in the somatic nervous system. The cell bodies are located here in the spinal cord. And at the end, at the axon terminals, they release acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. Now the, the difference is what happens in the postganglionic neurons. In the postganglionic neurons, so I've shaded out the somatic nervous system because there aren't ganglia that make up that system. It's only in the autonomic nervous system where we find these ganglia. The postganglionic neurons are going to be different depending upon the division of the autonomic nervous system we're talking about. So in the parasympathetic nervous system, those ganglionic neurons also use acetylcholine. So you have two neurons in a row and both of these neurons are using acetylcholine. Within the sympathetic nervous system, these neurons release norepinephrine. And they're not, the norepinephrine is, isn't exactly like a neurotransmitter here. It's not like it's releasing it at a synapse that will allow for the norepinephrine to bind to receptors at a postsynaptic site to induce, say, a change in a neuron or a muscle or something like that. That's, that's the way it does with acetylcholine. Instead, the norepinephrine here is being released into the bloodstream so that it can act across the body. Uh, it's being released in, in targeted ways. So a lot of these nerves will be, say, up along the gut, along the heart, along the circulatory system, along the lungs. But then the norepinephrine sort of spreads a bit, and then it acts on those tissues to get it into a fight or flight response. Norepinephrine is a stress hormone and this allows for the nervous system to, to have an automatic release. So this is a little bit different than the cortisol response. The cortisol response is relatively slow. As we saw, it takes minutes for you to start to see an increase in cortisol. This norepinephrine response can be almost immediate, within seconds. And so if you've ever been to like a haunted house, and if you've ever seen, uh, you know, like a ghost uh, jump out and scare you, the, the, um, the, uh, what's happening at that immediate moment when you have that 
freak out and your heart rate all of a sudden is going up, that is the sympathetic nervous system getting uh, activated and releasing norepinephrine. And then you have that intense like panting and being freaked out. Your eyes are dilated so that you can see the world a little bit more around you. That's what's happening. It's this portion of the nervous system that's getting activated. And then minutes later, you're going to have cortisol also being increased just in case you need it when you're traveling through the haunted house. So it's important to have a little bit of understanding of the types of nerves that come out of these various systems and a little bit more of the anatomical organization. Again, I don't have, I don't expect you to have this completely memorized. Um, but I do want to touch on some of the important nerves that uh, you know you've already have kind of learned, and that the the description of just how that they also are part of these different uh, portions of the autonomic nervous system. So we've learned about the ocular motor nerve. Um, it also the there's a portion of the ocular motor nerve that synapses onto one of these ganglia that is involved in pupil constriction. There's the facial nerve, which is involved in stimulation of saliva. The glossopharyngeal nerve, we, we uh, have mentioned that before. Um, it receives some input from the tongue or the back of the mouth for taste. It is also involved in uh, saliva production. And a really big important part of controlling the overall viscera is the vagus nerve. So this is a huge nerve that comes out of the brainstem. This is cranial nerve 10. And you can see all the different kinds of things that the vagus nerve innervates. So the vagus nerve goes way down. It has all these big branches. It connects to the lungs. It connects to the heart, uh, the stomach, the pancreas, the small intestine. This is just actually a sub list. It's involved in all kinds of things regulating overall visceral function. And it, you know, but it does operate through this um, preganglionic and postganglionic system where it synapses into ganglia that makes up the parasympathetic nervous system. There's also the splanchnic nerve, which uh, is, innervates the large intestine, the bladder, and the reproductive organs. We'll talk a little bit more about the balance of parasympathetic and sympathetic control over reproduction when we talk about sex. Since the sympathetic nervous system is part of the peripheral nervous system that runs parallel to the parasympathetic system, it obviously has projections as well, but it's not organized in the way that the parasympathetic division is with nerves that, say, make up part of the facial nerves or, or specific nerves that come out and then innervate these ganglia. Instead, the sympathetic nervous system has this line of ganglia that makes up the sympathetic chain. And so this is a big, long chain of ganglia that are actually all interconnected. And the, the preganglionic neurons, most of them are relatively short, and they synapse just onto those. The, um, so, and then there's different divisions. So this, is a, a, this literally is just like a line of ganglia, different than the dorsal root ganglia. Uh, it's not the same, right? These are neurons that are coming, taking information away from the nervous system. It's going um efferent from the nervous system so these neurons that are um and then remember these neurons that are part of the 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 different ganglia they are releasing norepinephrine right because this is inducing a fight or flight response so we have these different divisions the the cervical portion uh does the opposite control to the parasympathetic division and then it dilates the eyes and inhibits salivation we have the thoracic ganglia, which in, induces an increase in heart rate and relaxes the air, the lungs. Um, we have a something called the celiac ganglion, which shouldn't be surprising if you know about what celiac disease is. The celiac ganglion has regulation over digestion. Then we also have the collateral ganglia. These ganglia have regulation over the large intestine, the bladder, so this is the excretory systems. It also has regulation over the reproductive organs, which that's what uh, we will talk about that in detail when we talk about sex. This is a video, this link, um, I encourage you to look at it. It's just a minute. This, uh, it really shows that um, it's just looking at an, uh, a model of a human nervous system, the spinal cord, and it nicely illustrates where you would find this sympathetic chain. And it kind of shows the different nerves and its relationship to the sympathetic chain. So what are the factors that are regulating um, autonomic nervous system function? Uh, 
we have the uh, not just the visceral reflexes that plays an important role in this, but also there are major regions of the central nervous system that will auto, that will regulate and initiate autonomic nervous system function. So the hypothalamus, in particular the paraventricular nucleus, is especially important to this. It projects to the brainstem to influence autonomic outflow. So it'll have since the hypothalamus is is a critical regulator over the balance of homeostasis within the body, some of that being done by hormone regulation, but some of it is also just regulating the outflow of the autonomic nervous system, striking that balance between parasympathetic and sympathetic control. The, the amygdala uh, is, um, is a, uh, a very important nucleus that regulates emotion and fear. And we will be taught, we have an entire lecture talking about the amygdala. So we'll talk about this a little bit more detail when we talk about the amygdala. But there's a portion of the amygdala that also contributes to parasympathetic outflow. And then, of course, there's the brain stem. So there's a bunch of different areas of the brain stem, the locus ceruleus, portions of uh, the medulla, uh, as well as serotonergic cells that are within the pontine and medullary raphe contributions to sympathetic outflow. So the brainstem will actually have a, an enormous amount of control that leads to regulating whether the sympathetic nervous system is activated or not. So much of the autonomic nervous system functions by largely by visceral reflexes. So these are not something that we have any conscious control over. Instead, it's subconscious signals from our brainstem, from our hypothalamus, from the amygdala, that has control over, say, the visceral organs, um, and it triggers, uh, and then and then you can have a trigger of some subconscious reflex back to the visceral organ. Okay, so there's there can be this this uh, sort of like how we have the reflex for the uh, the um, uh, the knee jerk reflex. We can see something similar happening in many parts of the of the autonomic nervous system. So this is going to be one example that we're going to talk about here which is called the baroreceptor reflex. So this is just one example. Uh, there are baroreceptors that are located in the carotid sinus and the aortic arch. These baroreceptors, they detect pressure. So this is a specialized kind of receptor that can detect how much pressure is happening within the aorta. So for those of you that, that you should know this, but this the aorta is this major the main artery that comes out of the heart and then will then take blood to the entire body these receptors you know, so the the body needs to, to have um a, a monitoring system for what kind of flow is happening through the aorta and also a way to change it if it needs to be changed and so that's what this this reflex is looking at so these barrel receptors are located there and uh, when they detect too much or too little stretch due to elevated or decreased blood pressure, respectively. So if there's like blood pressure is increased way too much, all of a sudden your blood pressure is way too high, um, you, it'll detect stretch. Um, or let's say all of a sudden you've had a big cut and you're bleeding out, say, from your femoral artery, your blood pressure is going to decrease. The, the, because the pressure, the, the, the blood flow through your your uh, circulatory system decreases. Um, this is going to lead to a decrease in pressure here in the aortic arch and it'll be detected there. So it'll detect both of these things, whether there's too much or too little. These signals are transferred up to the brainstem into a circuit here. This is via the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, from there, you can get then regulation that is then transported down to the vagus nerve the vagus nerve uh, then comes back down and will regulate overall pressure by um, releasing factors or diminishing factors, uh, uh, primarily through norepinephrine, um, through a sympathetic ganglion, that uh, um, that will then change the um, the the flow of the blood going to the heart that will then also affect the strength of heart contra contractions. And it'll, and that's how you get that direct reaction so that the heart can change its overall blood pressure. And so you essentially, it's, it's, a, it's a system that has receptors here. If there's a big change in pressure here, whether too much or too little, it will then be sent up to the brainstem 
where it is then that information is then sent down to the vagus nerve where the vagus nerve can either increase or decrease its firing which will allow for an increase or decrease in norepinephrine which will then can adjust the heart rate and so it's a very relatively simple reflex and you can see that there's no conscious control here none of this information makes it up into the cortex where we consider consciousness to be primarily regulated this is just a simple reflex. It can happen relatively quickly, just like the knee-jerk reflex. So this figure, this is, um, I, th I think, really the last figure I'm going to show about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. This is a very helpful figure that I feel like summarizes everything. Uh, it has, so we've got a table here that talks about the differences between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Uh, the first line is the main function with the parasympathetic division doing rest and digest type functions. Whereas the sympathetic nervous system, when that's activated, it's getting the body ready for fight or flight response. And it also talks about the origin of preganglionic neurons, where they're located. Um, the type of neurotransmitter in the preganglionic neurons is the same for both of them, that we have acetylcholine in both. Uh, location of postganglionic neurons. Uh, in the parasympathetic division, these postganglionic neurons tend to be very close to the heart, where the in the sympathetic division, um, most of these ganglia are actually very close to the spinal cord along that uh, sympathetic chain that goes along the, the, the spinal cord, whereas the, the ganglia for the parasympathetic division tend to be close to the organ. Then the neurotransmitter that's in the postganglionic neuron, again, Parasympathetic division, it's acetylcholine, which is going to act on that smooth muscle to just sort of keep things going. Whereas the sympathetic postganglionic neurons release norepinephrine, which causes the, the neuron to get into fight or flight response, inducing essentially a stress response. And then this is showing the essentially this table in a pretty nice layout. We have these two neurons. These are these would be located in the brainstem or spinal cord. Both are releasing acetylcholine at the uh, at the preganglionic site and then within the ganglion and then the postganglionic neurons that's where you're going to have a difference where in the parasympathetic nervous system it's going to be releasing acetylcholine there's a couple neurons that release nitric oxide and um, that the in the sympathetic neurons that we have norepinephrine both acting on target organs and then having different responses primarily because it's either acetylcholine being released which is going to allow those organs to have rest and digest type functions Whereas if the sympathetic division is activated, it's norepinephrine driving fight or flight response. To wrap up, so uh, I've got two sections for key questions since this, this uh, presentation really breaks down into kind of two major divisions, um, sort of like the autonomic nervous system. We've got two divisions to the talk today. Um, so the first few questions are about the hypothalamus and then also about the HPA and uh, axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So you should really know what make up the parts of the HPA axis and how it's controlled. That is really important for this. The other thing is that the, um, what are the effects of chronic stress on the body and the brain and on behavior? So we spent a fair amount of time talking about that. That's particularly relevant for the current conditions we're living in. And uh, yeah, so it's good to know the details of what that looks like. Then we also, you know, we spent a long time talking about the autonomic nervous system, that uh, what are the ganglia involved, not necessarily knowing the names of each and every ganglia, but the, can you tell me some of the differences between parasympathetic and sympathetic ganglia? like where are they located, what kind of neurotransmitters are found within the ganglia, do you even know what a ganglion is? You should look that up if you're still confused on what the heck that means. You really need to understand that. Um, that there are uh, various tissues that are innervated by the autonomic nervous system and that they regulate various functions and you should definitely know the, the different kinds of neurotransmitters that are involved in the different subdivisions of the autonomic nervous system. Last but not least, this is a slide that's covering the different hypothalamic nuclei, some of which we are going to be talking about, uh, some of which we did talk about, which is the paraventricular nucleus.
Um, and we won't be revisiting it again because it's also involved in oxytocin and vasopressin. I didn't want to include it here because there's just too much to cover. It also covers areas that we're not going to be discussing in this section or discussing at all, but I wanted to include it just in case you uh, wanted to look at what these different brain areas are involved in. So this is that. Take a look. Uh, again, I'm not going to have you uh, memorize this slide. This is just extra um, so that you can get an overview if you are particularly interested in this. And that is it for this lecture. So um, we will see you next time.